Ms. Pennington is the world authority on EEG, biofeedback, meditation, and founder of the Institute for the Awakened Mind. She's a popular ARE speaker and an author of the top-selling ARE press book, Your Psychic Soul, Embracing Your Sixth Sense, and a companion set of CDs that go along with it called The Meditation Experience. Judith is also the author of a groundbreaking book entitled The Voice of the Soul about inspired writing and the science of spirituality. Judith, wherever you are, I know we agreed to pare back your bio. She was being very modest. But when I read the following about the book and her own personal journey, I felt it would, I would be remiss if I didn't share it with you because I know you're all here to find out how she got to where she is and why she's teaching you this. A busy freelance writer, a peace group director, and a single parent who at the age of 38 believed in neither herself nor God. Yet she picks up a pen and paper late one night and listens to an inner voice and records the wisest, most sensible guidance she's ever heard. Who or what is the source of the lyrical writings that beckon her out of her darkness into the depths of her own psyche and on life-changing journeys to spiritual centers in Medjugorje, Finhorn, and the Celtic Isle of Iona? In her book, The Voice of the Soul, she teaches what she knows best, how to listen to the voice of truth within and be guided by it. In reading 2031, Edgar Cayce said, know that it is not all just to live, not all just to be good, but good for something, that ye may fulfill that purpose for which ye have entered this experience. I believe Judith is doing just that. And with that, I present to you Judith Pennington. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for your warm, loving welcome. It's such a pleasure to be here at the ARE always because I feel like I'm here with like-minded friends and like-minded spirits, and that's such a great energy. And I'm also happy to be here tonight because of the program we're doing. Uh, which I hope and expect you will find to be one of the most fascinating and useful experiences of your life. And the reason for that is because what we're going to look at is a brainwave biofeedback map to meditation and higher states of consciousness. And as with any map, you hold it in hand, you can see where you are, where you want to go, and how to get there. And along the way, we're going to make a few stops with exercises and meditations that you can landmark that will help you remember that state of consciousness and how to get back to it. A landmark is a word, a concept, a body sensation, maybe an image. So you'll be able to connect the landmarks with states of consciousness as we go through this PowerPoint show, and then get back there on your own. Does that sound like a plan? All right. So our first question is, what are brain waves? Well, it's quite simply, brain waves are the electrical activities of consciousness, of the mind. We see them in the brain, which is the repository of consciousness, but not the source of consciousness. Depending on how fast we're thinking, that's how fast the wave is. You see this wave up at the top uh, right, that red one, that's a fast thought. The wave is moving fast, the thought is moving fast. And down at the bottom where the waves are spread out, the thought is slower. This is the kind of thought you might have in meditation or in dreaming or, or daydreaming or any kind of relaxed state of consciousness. Now brain waves at one time were unheard of, but you're hearing about them all the time now, partly because the US and other countries have dumped literally millions of dollars into the study of the brain, which is really good news because suddenly now there are all these uh, studies on the brain meditation and consciousness. And people in the West who always want proof of everything are saying to themselves, oh, well then this is real. We've been hearing about this from yogis and Hindu and Tibetan Buddhist meditators for thousands of years, but in the West we need the proof. 
And we especially got the proof in 1957 when a gentleman named Joe Camilla, who was a psychologist at a Midwestern university, started looking around at the field of biofeedback which was just beginning to prove that the body could be self-regulated. And not only self-regulated, that what the yogis had always said was true, that you could cure migraine headaches, even epilepsy, anxiety, panic disorder, by regulating your body, basically through breathing, through warming your hands, and things like that. And Camille looked at this research and said, well, wait a minute, if you can self-regulate the body, then can you self-regulate the brain, the mind, consciousness? And so he had a student named Richard Bach, who I still wonder if he's the same one as Jonathan Livingston Siegel, <laughs> but don't really know. And um, Richard Bach, he hooked up to an EEG, an electroencephalograph, which measures the brainwave activities of consciousness. And um, almost instantaneously, Bach was able to identify through a biofeedback landmark what it felt like to be an alpha. And he was so good at producing alpha waves that eventually somebody tuned up a little model railroad uh, train and put it on a railroad track and tuned it to alpha and Bach could send it right around the train track just by producing alpha. So that pretty much convinced everybody that brainwave biofeedback had extraordinary ramifications. Now here in the United States, they began to use brainwave biofeedback to cure pathology. But in England, a gentleman named C. Maxwell Cade, up there at the top right, he was an English biophysicist who made real headway into radar. But he was also a Zen meditation master, a master hypnotist, invented uh, the first uh, and very ancient, as you can see, a machine that was used to um, measure the activities of consciousness. This is an electroencephalograph here, one that worked on diodes, little flashing lights, that would show these frequencies of consciousness uh, as a composite pattern an integrated composite pattern. And uh, they put this machine on thousands of people, as Cade says in this quote here, and they found out some very interesting things. He wrote in his book, a seminal book called The Awakened Mind, Biofeedback, and the Development of Higher States of Awareness, that from our studies of the brainwave patterns of some 3,000 pupils, as well as swamis, yogis, Zen masters, healers, mediums, and clairvoyants, it has become possible to establish that all of the unusual abilities that some people are able to manifest, such as self-control of pain and healing, healing of others, telepathy, etc., are associated with changes in the EEG pattern towards a more bio bilaterally symmetrical and integrated form. So he's saying some really interesting and important things here. First, he's saying that people who uh, are able to uh, heal and uh, perceive intuitively all have the same brainwave pattern. And that's the brainwave pattern we're going to work on tonight, called the awakened mind. Kate originally called it lucid awareness, a new fifth state of consciousness that um, he discovered on the mind mirror EEG. But he's also saying here that anyone can develop this state of consciousness through brainwave training. And that's exactly what he did uh, from 1976 when he invented the mind mirror until he passed away in the mid-1990s, is train these students to a template, a blueprint pattern that is bilaterally symmetrical and um, also integrated. And this is the pattern here. Kevin, will you run your cursor down toward the bottom of that pattern and press play? He's going to get it going for us, so you can, to the left-hand side, so you can see it in motion. There it is. Okay. So integrated because four categories of consciousness, the high, fast waves and beta, the slower waves and alpha, the still slower waves in theta and delta are uh, connected 
so that they're uh, aware of each other and that there's an open flow of consciousness down from the conscious mind of beta into the subconscious theta into the unconscious delta and back which means that the person who has this pattern is in a create a state of creative flow and peak performance because they then have access to all of the qualities of the mind. We're going to look at each one of these individually so you can see and understand them and most importantly feel them. The beta conscious mind being able to connect with its deeper self, John Van Auken today called it the uh, the best self, the better self. Uh, some would call it the higher self down in the subconscious and the still higher self down in delta, all in an open flow of awareness. Now, it's not just meditation that produces this state of consciousness and allows people to have these higher abilities. Some people produce it just naturally and normally on their own through uh, communication with nature. They'll have a peak experience, and maybe you've had one yourself. You're walking out in nature, it's just so quiet and calm and beautiful, and suddenly an insight to a problem you've been working on for a long time just pops into your mind. Well, that's because nature generates this alpha bridge that gives you access to your subconscious and your unconscious levels of mind. Maybe you do creative work, that also can develop this pattern. So can spiritual study, so can um, even intellectual study because that develops a, an ability to uh, stabilize and focus the mind. It develops something called attentional awareness so that you can stay in a state of consciousness. When you can stay there, then you can develop this pattern. Now, um, Kevin, if you play it one more time, uh, this pattern uh, is of uh, a man in India. Uh, he is from New Delhi. His name is Amit Kohli. Uh, he is a spiritual teacher there. He traveled to uh, Kolkata where I was doing a brainwave training for a new practitioner of this kind of meditation to teach other people to do it. And um, we hooked up Amit, and he showed this beautiful awakened mind pattern where he had this open flow in consciousness. And what it means when you have this pattern is that um, at least as long as you hold it, you are awake. You are more and more vividly aware of ordinary reality, and you suddenly realize that there's multiple realities. You're excited, warm, enthusiastic, uh, you have this ability to connect with your deeper self and pull up information, creative solutions to any kind of challenge. What's my next best step in life? What's the best work for me? Um, how do I resolve a relationship problem? And manifest those answers into your life, which ultimately makes you able to self-actualize and then become self-realized in terms of your own spiritual awareness. And so Amit had this pattern. Many people who are meditators have this pattern, and that's how it usually develops. And if you're a long-term meditator, you already know this. Meditation enables you to become uh, more centered, more coherent, uh, because the two sides of your brain are getting balanced as you move deeper down into those lower uh, and slower frequencies. Your brain thought flows better. Your brain then uh, integrates with the spine and the central nervous system, which in turn integrates uh, and flows electricity and rejuvenating energies to every cell in your body to heal and restore the body. And that's the sense of inner peace that we get in meditation. The um, involuntary and voluntary nervous systems, they come together. So meditation is by far the fastest and most reliable way to develop this awakened mind pattern and to sustain it. But then you might ask, well, what keeps 
everyone from developing this pattern. Because in truth, children have this pattern. When they're young, you know how they are, daydreamy, they tell creative stories, they're happy, they're open to everyone, they're open to new experience. They have this awakened mind pattern as children. But then life becomes more and more complex and the pattern is not so available. Uh, the conscious mind speeds up and they get disconnected from themselves. And so there's this little story that I want to tell you um, that kind of embodies why we don't all have this awakened mind pattern. So there um, is a lion out in the jungle that's captured and brought to a prison yard uh, with very high fence. And he's there for a while and then he notices the lions who have been there uh, the longest and that they have basically formed three groups. Uh, one group of lions meets uh, regularly to uh, plot and plan uh, how to uh, take violence against their captors and get out of there. Another group meets regularly to uh, sing about the day and the future when there will be no fence. A third group meets uh, secretly to plan violence against all the other groups. And so the newcomer lion uh, is pressured by all these groups to join them, but he, he holds back because he notices that there's one lion, uh, a solitary lion, who seems to be deep in thought and um, thinking about something and he just has this feeling and one day he goes to this solitary lion and he says, so why don't you join the other groups? Uh, and the lion says, join nothing. He says, they are not doing what is necessary or taking the necessary action. I am doing what is essential. He said, you listen closely. Uh, and the newcomer lion says, well, what is this necessary thing? And the solitary lion said, I am studying the nature of the fence. <laughs> Rings a bell, doesn't it? Because of course that's our plight here uh, as human beings. Some of us are singing Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the rest of the world, there's a lot of people plotting violence uh, rather than looking at the fence. And so where are the fences? Well, of course you know that the fences are between you and other people. I'm sure you can think of relationships right now uh, that that's true of. There are fences that we have between us and our spirit. But the worst fences are those that are between us and our own selves. And you could certainly make a case that it's those fences that create the external ones, right? Somebody ought to tell that poor lion because it's not just one fence. So what we're going to do now and uh, for the rest of this um, presentation is to show you what some of the fences are uh, that we have set up against ourselves that are in our way and how to take them down so we can go anywhere we want to go in meditation and higher consciousness to do what is the basic purpose of the awakened mind pattern. And that is to develop a bilaterally, as Cade said, symmetrical brainwave pattern that is integrated and in these four primary levels of consciousness, the beta up at the top and the red, orange and yellow, the alpha, in the green, a sensory bridge, down to the subconscious mind in theta and the unconscious mind in delta. We're going to go through these one at a time. But when they are united, then we have the ability to do self-discovery and healing transformation work, which is the basis of the inner transformation that takes down all those fences. Make sense? All right. So let's look at the first fence. And these are our fastest frequencies of consciousness, the ones that you are listening to me with right now. 
if I talk really fast, you're going to have to process really fast to catch up with every single word. But if I talk a little slower, your beta waves will slow down. Uh, beta, the conscious mind, is that of active external awareness. It's your verbal logic and intellect. Uh, it's your everyday externalized awareness. Uh, if you speed up your beta, say you're at home, it's the end of the day, you go and sit on the couch, you watch a television or read a book, and you feel yourself slowing down. Everybody knows this feeling, right? You feel your, oh, the body starts to relax because, of course, the mind and the body are one unit. They do the same things. The body starts to relax. The mind slows down. But then you say, oh, oh, my gosh, I have to get up and make this list. I have so many decisions to make. And zoom, up go your beta brain waves in speed so you can compute and process more. And something interesting happens when you do that. So this right here, from the center line to the left and to the right, is called amplitude. So the frequencies go from the highest frequencies to the lowest. The amplitude is the width of this pattern. The beta that you're looking at here is the beta of random, ordinary thinking. But once you start to make a list or to make decisions, then the amplitude of your beta waves increases so that there's more activity in the highest frequencies and there's more amplitude in the pattern as a whole. Does that make sense? Because we've all felt it happen. Uh, if you are making that list and those decisions, and you realize all of a sudden that there's something you can't resolve or don't see a way to resolve, or you're in that lion yard, uh, and you're trying so hard to figure out the way through the fence, you might rise into high beta. Those are the brain waves of stress, anxiety, and panic. They're going to be very high amplitude, very high frequencies. At that point, you would be moving into what Edgar Cayce called broken points of consciousness. Everybody knows what this feels like. You just get so wound up that your thoughts start to fragment. And when that happens, you can't really keep track. You can't string together ideas in a holistic way. It's just a bouncing sensation. Nothing good happens from that, despite what uh, a lot of business people still think, that the faster you work and the harder you go, the more productive you'll be. And in fact, it's just the opposite. The less productive you are because you can't think straight. So our first exercise is going to be how to quiet the ego's monkey mind in beta when beta starts moving too fast and you don't know what to do. So what we're going to do first is the hardest thing, and then it's going to get easier from here. I'm going to ask you to actually speed up your thinking, uh, to bring to mind an experience of stress uh, mild stress, not some childhood trauma, you know, something simple and easy like being caught in traffic or having an argument with uh, someone else. And to relive that experience for about 30 seconds, maybe less if there's a wave of energy that comes and whacks me, then I'll know you've had more than enough. <laughs> but, but I just want to ask you a couple of questions before you open your eyes and get your feedback on, on what you experienced, okay? So we'll start timing, if you'll just please close your eyes. And bring to mind some experience of stress. Recreate it. And now notice where, if anywhere, there is tension in your body. And notice the position of your tongue. And then come on back. 
Now, that was only 20 seconds, because you guys stressed out really well. <laughs> Could you could you feel it? There was you know there was a field in in the room that developed very fast. Okay, so where did anybody volunteer, please? Where did you feel stress in your bodies? Anywhere. Um, actually, we're going to have a microphone come around uh, in a bit, but um, f yeah, it could it could come now, sure. If people who want to share. Uh, so up here in the front, uh, you were going to say that you felt stress where? I felt stress in my upper back and shoulders in the back. Okay. It automatically tightened. I didn't do it consciously. And where was your tongue? My tongue was straight ahead. Straight out. Okay. And the lady next to you then? I noticed an, I noticed an increase in respiration, and I felt shakiness um, across my chest, which included my shoulders. Right. And my tongue was at the bottom of my mouth. It was at the bottom. Straight. Was it tense? Yes. Okay, all right, yeah. Can we hear from somebody over here then who would like to share? Um, there are a couple of people here in this first row. Okay, I uh, felt the tension in my neck, my shoulders, and my lower back. Yes. And my tongue was pressed firmly against my teeth, were gritted. Right, right, okay. You're a good stressor. You've got an A. Plus. I do it a lot. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> okay. Um, I felt stress from my solar plexus straight up through, and my um, tongue was like kind of compressed between my jaw that was then, you know, tense. So everything from like here straight up through was just tight. All right, great. Thanks for sharing that. So what we've seen here is pretty much a whole body experience. Some people say that they feel stress in their low back. Uh, a lot of people do. That's that's where I tend to carry it. Um, and so the purpose of this exercise was to really uh, underline how connected the mind is to the body, right? That was a physical manifestation of a mental state. So what's happening in your mind is going to happen in your body. What's happening in your body is going to happen in your mind. Now the second half of this exercise, you're going to see a shift. Feel how the room feels right now. It feels kind of spiky like those beta waves, doesn't it? Okay, so for, the, for now, for an entire minute, we're going to uh, ask you to relax the back of your tongue just with your eyes closed, and you can go ahead and close them now. Start to relax the back of your tongue so that your tongue may float in your mouth, may just rest against the palate. Just allow it to completely relax. Your focus on your tongue. Keeping your tongue relaxed. Okay, that's close to a minute. Now feel the energy in the room. It's very different, isn't it? And I can see that the energy in you is different. I saw a few people yawn because the relaxation was moving down towards sleep. And you have a question there in the back? She found herself smiling. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing about the tongue tensing up is that when your body tenses, the tongue tenses, 
And what I've seen, and maybe you have too, is that the person who stresses out immediately picks up the phone or walks over to somebody else and ejects that stress on them. Because the body, they can't tolerate the body holding that stress. So they want to get rid of it and don't know how to get rid of it. But you do, literally. And you can use this little yogic technique in daily life, not just to reduce your beta waves to drop into meditation, but also if you run into a traffic jam. It's a self-regulation exercise that works like a charm. And then there's another one we're going to do right now, because beta can be very insidious. I mean, we can get ourselves into high anxiety states, and maybe you need more than one technique to, to bring those beta waves down, to quiet the chattering of that monkey mind. And this is uh, a directly physical exercise uh, that requires you to, uh, first of all, for one minute, um, and Kevin, will you time that for me? I can't see the clock very well in here. Uh, for exactly one minute when, when we say go, to count your full breaths, and that's going to be the, in breath, the, the inhalation and the exhalation. That counts as the number one. And then another uh, round of the inhalation and exhalation, that's two. And then, so you just count successively. And this time, for this first minute, don't alter your breath weight in any way. Just breathe as you normally breathe, okay? Uh, just for one minute and do the counting. Any questions about that? Make sense? All right. Okay, so we start right now. Okay, and stop counting now, and just come on back. That has its own little relaxation, doesn't it? Because it's the focusing of awareness, and any time you put the attention of the mind on the body, then those two sensory systems, the voluntary and involuntary systems, integrate and unite. And that is a lot of the explanation of inner peace that comes out of meditation, just the focusing of awareness. So how are your numbers, if you just shout them out? 12, 11, 13? 7? 13, 9? Anybody higher than 17 and 18? Oh, you're a good group. So the normal breath rate, some say 7 to 17. Uh, breaths per minute, some say 8 to 18. But if you're breathing 17, 18 times a minute, then you're breathing shallow and you're breathing fast. And that means that your central nervous system and in fact every cell and atom in your body is sped up and you're therefore in high beta. See? So slowing down your breath will shift your state of consciousness. And probably even more so than relaxing your tongue did, because now you will have had two focused awareness exercises, and that beta will relax even more. But there will probably be a perceptual shift in consciousness. But this time, I'll ask you to deliberately slow down your breath rate. You, you can't lose consciousness because your autonomic nervous system will take over and make you breathe. So there's nothing to worry about. But do just slow your breath, breathing uh, to a comfortable rate for the next 60 seconds. And I think you're going to feel a shift. Okay? So we'll start right now. 
counting your full breaths. Breathing slower and deeper. Okay, and stop counting now. The room has a lot more stillness in it. Can you feel it? Yeah. Okay, so to hear from a few people, where did you go from what rate to what? 11 to 5. 11 to 5, okay. 4 from where? From 13. Started at 13, got to 4. 4 from where? 12 to 4. Fantastic. 7 to 4. 7 to 4. Can you feel a shift in yourself? This is the dive toward meditation. Chances are, just that easily, you moved into the next lower and slower uh, bandwidth of brain waves, and that's called alpha. You gotta love these Greeks, they named everything, didn't they? <laughs> alpha uh, is green, uh, yellow in color, and this is completely appropriate uh, the frequencies determine those colors. Appropriate because these are the frequencies of nature. I took that shot uh, in the Virginia Beach Park, park some years ago. Um, alpha is the bridge between the conscious and the subconscious mind. You may feel relaxed, detached, and diffused right now, a little daydreamy. This is your sensory awareness. Nature generates this sensory awareness because you notice texture, shape, form, sound, color, rhythms, uh, the feelings of what you touch, even what you perceive through your eyes has got a, a feeling and a texture to it. Um, I wrote here that alpha, when you're in alpha, then you are resonating with the 8 to 14 hertz frequencies of nature, and therefore, this is where you get sharp, vivid imagery in the outside world. And in meditation, when imagery comes up from the lower and slower frequencies, it's alpha that clothes those impulses, uh, those insights, with uh, an almost cartoon-like vividness. Um, physical healing is experienced here. A lot of studies have shown that, um, that alpha is active when people are sending and receiving healing. We're going to see in a minute that it's actually more than just alpha, but alpha is by far the predominant set of frequencies. We love alpha because um, alpha... Uh, well, you were a kid sitting in a classroom, right? You were looking out the window and watching the squirrel and watching the leaves blow. And the wretched teacher said, Johnny, what are you doing? And you startled up because you were quieter in your mind. Everybody has to have alpha because it is such a respite from beta. Whether you get that respite by sitting on your couch and doing nothing at the end of the day or by taking a walk in nature, that's what brings down high beta. Concentration uh, on any kind of sensory task will reduce high beta brain waves into relaxation. Uh, some people will go to the bar to have a martini at the end of the work day and have to. That's how they get out of high beta. <laughs> Uh, so it's an anesthetizer of a sort uh, by bringing down that beta. <coughs> now the important thing about alpha, uh, besides <coughs> its relaxation uh, benefits, is that it's the bridge down to theta. Uh, 
Theta is the subconscious mind of long-term memory, past life and present life. Every hypnotist knows this. You have to go down to Theta to get your past life memories. Uh, it's also where personal healing must take place because this is where our issues are stored. Long-term memory stores them here. Um, but the good thing about it is that uh, the soul or the essential being also resides here alongside those issues. So then we have the potential to heal them. The question is, who's speaking your issue or your soul, as John Van Aken brought up today? But we're going to take a look at that and show you uh, easy and important ways to know the difference. This is also where REM sleep, uh, rapid eye movement sleep, your dreams take place. Uh, if you're in theta only, without the benefit of alpha and REM sleep, and you're dreaming, then the imagery in theta is going to be murky. You can't access it, hazy, indistinct. But the moment alpha comes up, uh, then the imagery is clothed in sharpness and vividness and it can move up into the conscious mind and you get the message, you get the uh, impulse of information. So let's see for ourselves uh, with a meditation that I think you're going to enjoy a whole lot. Um, this meditation has the potential to be an alpha-theta meditation. I think it will because you have done so great already with your relaxations. Um, we don't even have to do the usual thing you do with a meditation, which is to focus your awareness on your breath and relax your body, because the brain loves mind play. And this is going to be a mind play kind of meditation. Uh, and, and it will fully engage in this meditation without any preparation whatsoever. So, you ready? If you will, then, just please close your eyes. And begin to imagine yourself or become aware of yourself as some kind of animal. You could be a real animal or a fantasy animal. If you don't know what kind of animal you are, look down at your feet or hooves, or talons. Notice how big you are. What is your covering or hide or skin? How do you get around from one place to another? What kind of sound do you make? How do you communicate? <coughs> Do you live alone or with a mate or a group? Where do you live? As this animal 
What makes you happy? What makes you sad? What makes you feel strong and powerful? What gives you courage? Now live the experience of being this animal for a few moments on your own. It's almost time to come back to your human form. But before you do, become aware of two or three qualities and characteristics that represent who you are as this animal, that represent your essential nature. And now imagine yourself in your human life with the qualities and characteristics of your animal fully integrated and embodied. What would your life look like if you were to integrate your animal qualities and characteristics? See them fully embodied. Now take a moment to send your clear memory, awareness of these qualities and characteristics up to your beta thinking mind so you can remember them when you come back from the meditation. And remember too, 
what it feels like to be an alpha. Find a word, concept, or body sensation that will help you descend into alpha quickly and easily later on. And then when you're ready, just come right on back to this outside space. To fully arouse, you can rub your hands together, your feet against the floor, and then these nerve endings will wake you right up. It also helps to take a big, deep, sharp breath and blow it out hard. (sighs) There I am. Yeah. So let's get the microphone because we want to hear from several people about what your experience. And if you don't mind, let's let it be those who got some really interesting uh, uh, experiences of being an animal to start with. And then if you didn't, uh, we'll address those questions afterward. So can we have some volunteers if you're back enough yet? A lady up here in the front. For some reason, right before you even started the meditation, the image of a bear came into my head. Uh So when you said, imagine being an animal, he was already there. (laughs) Um, It was a big brown bear, um, known for his strength because of his size, his claws, but very protective. Uh, I couldn't, at, at times I got the sense it was female, at times I got the sense it was male, so I really, but very protective. Very um, protective, protective okay. of um, its surroundings, um, but in the same breath, very solitary and very alone. Okay. So, and that was one thing that um, came through strongly that they were either they would have been happy with the mate. Would have been right. happier with a mate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it was um, it was really interesting. So just to go through, and I, when you said where Alaska came into my, I don't know, brown bears are in Alaska, but that's what came into my head. And um, fishing, and it was really very vivid, and usually I don't get things that vividly. I wonder if you had a past life bear. I, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was good. Okay. And so what were then your qualities and characteristics as this bear? Um, the qualities that came through was... Um, like I said, for a protectiveness of its surroundings. Um, I have a feeling that it would have been very protective of any um, children um, and very loyal. Okay, nice. So nice those qualities. Were the two that came through very strongly. And did you say something about warm and loving, or did I imagine that? Um, was that part that of the protectiveness, through, or was I that, think that was, instinctual? Yeah, that kinda, yeah I think that uh, was part of the protectiveness. Okay. The reason they were so, they would have been so protective was because of the loving. Okay. I must have associated a teddy bear with your I, bear. Maybe so. <laughs> but, but as you're going to see in just a minute, um, yeah. that bear popped up for you before we started this meditation mm-hmm. because you have very good delta waves. That's your psychic awareness that presages what's about to happen. So that's very good. And um, you can, when your delta waves are on, which yours very clearly were, then you can really count on this field, this quantum field of energy and information that some of us call God, uh, giving you something really important. So may I just ask without asking too much, (laughs) Um, do you, would that be helpful to you to feel protective and protected in your life and? A lot of what came through was I could associate with myself. Okay. So, so maybe this was a gift from your own soul down in Theta and maybe this was a gift to you from beyond Theta as well. So that's nice. Okay, and we're going to make sense of this in a minute. Okay, uh, someone else? Would you? Okay, back there. I, I was a raccoon, which it took a few moments because 
my mind was racing and of course it was like, well, is that what I should be? This one, that one. Like I switched animals rapidly. Uh-huh. And you then, said a raccoon? But I ended up with a raccoon. You're my first ever raccoon. <laughs> well, and you were like, what do you look like? I'm like, damn, I look cute. I <laughs> Um, and it was uh, courageous, cautious, and a protector. And it's protective. Yes. There's something in the field here. Okay, let's see if somebody else gets a protective too. Then it's triangulated. And, okay. Um, it was interesting because when you said to be the animal for a few moments. Yes. That was an awesome experience. I mean, it was like I literally felt myself running across the roof, climbing down, getting into a trash can. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Not that I right. like trash cans, but this, it was very, really cool. Um, and I can see where they, it does relate to my personality. What was that last part? It does relate to my personality. Oh, good. So you can see how remembering that you have these abilities in yourself yes. could be very useful. Mm -hmm. Don't you love that commercial that comes on TV where this woman um, needs to get uh, better eyeglasses? And kitty, 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 kitty. And she walks into this a raccoon trails after her. <laughs> and now you've had a vision of a raccoon, so that's wonderful. Okay, can we hear from one other person up here? I was a raccoon, too. <laughs> Resonance in the field. Okay. But I got different messages. Um, I saw the raccoon as mischievous. As w a mischievous, mischievous, okay. Mischievous, mischievous. And I saw myself digging through garbage cans also. But to me, that was a lot like looking for treasures in other people's used stuff, which I have fun doing, okay, <laughs> like at thrift stores and, <laughs> and um, flea markets and stuff like that. Okay. But the thing that was interesting is I saw... I focused on the mask that the raccoon was wearing. Wait, you focused on what? The mask. To me, the raccoon was wearing a mask. Cause they oh, were oh, the, the white eyes, eyes right? right. And um, I got the feeling that I often wear a mask and that I don't mm. reveal my true feelings or I'm, I'm sort of quiet. I watch, I don't talk all the time. So um, I think I need to be more open. Maybe it was a message that I should take the mask off yeah. and be more open. Beautiful. So the qualities and characteristics would be to Mischievous, mischievous, um, need to be more open. So okay. it wasn't what the raccoon had. Well, it was like something that maybe I don't want that characteristic. So I don't know if you're supposed to do that or not, but that's what I got out of that one. Yeah. And the other one was like, I don't know, reusing, enjoying other people's cast-offs. En enjoying other people's, did you say cast-offs? Yeah, what was in the garbage pail? Okay, so let's what would you think about that for a minute. <clears throat> other people's cast-offs. In other words, not isolating from or separating from, but being open and inviting and welcome to? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, so that then takes on a more pff, bigger, omnipresent uh, connotation. Nice. So you three, and may I ask the rest of you as well, did you feel like you got some information that is valid for you in your life today and this present moment? Go ahead. Let's what if you have a contractor who you think you let him give you the mic back there. What do you, what if you have a contrast to who you think you are? a contrast and seeing the animal with who you think you are. Exactly. Okay, let's take a few deep breaths and then explore that then, if we, we may. We've got time, we can do it, okay? So what was the animal and what was going on? A panther. A, a panther, okay. And I have a very vivid imagination, so the jungle scene and everything, the environment was right there. And it was so powerful, and I am so not in control. You were not in control of the... A lot of situations in life. And, okay, so you're talking so about you right exactly. now. Exactly. So what if your automatic mind went to a powerful 
symbol or a powerful thing and you're not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's your sense. And you've got good delta waves too. Because that's exactly what this exercise was about. It's called a beingness meditation because you're asked to project your uh, awareness into an external object. So in this case, it was an animal. It could have been a forest, a vegetable garden, a book, a instrument, just any thing imaginable. I've seen people do it to a cell phone and it actually works. People had a line to God, I'm talking to God. So, because the brain loves the mind play, right? But in actuality, you can't project into anybody but yourself. So when you project into your own theta subconscious, into your own soul, then what you're seeing is something that's really true and is really giving you some useful information. That's where a disjunct comes from. And so how you use this information is you create an I am sentence out of those qualities and characteristics that you got. I am strong, protected, uh, warm, loving, stable, uh, whatever it is, because this your soul has given you that information. It's telling you that those things exist within you. And of course, if you subscribe to quantum physics, all things exist within you. It's just a matter of bringing them up and amplifying certain qualities and characteristics. Casey tells us that if you create an ideal and you repeat that ideal as a mantra in meditation and in daily life, then you are building it in the very atoms and cells of your bodies. And this is the whole power of intention, right? So if you will simply repeat, what, and what were your qualities and characteristics then as the panther? Uh, being powerful and um, strong and being in control. Beautiful, beautiful. I see those things in you. And so does your higher self and so does your soul. And now your mind has. So the idea is just to get it down into your mind and into your heart so you feel it in your heart too. You know, we're talking about the mind here and the brain and consciousness, but of course that's about the heart. <laughs> what is the universe made of but the energy of love? Oh, yeah. And so these messages that we get are things that are meant to protect us, to help us, to see disjuncts, you know, so, so we can correct something. That's what this awakened mind meditation is all about, inner transformation you know, for our own sake, so that we can live up to that which we came here to be. And do we have a question back there? I am not a young person, but I saw myself as Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> I, felt, I felt in need of a mother, and I saw her mm. with me. So. I'm not sure if I'm wanting to be a stronger mothering type of person, mm -hmm. but I felt so fragile. Beautiful. You know, um, so your qualities and characteristics for what then? I'm somewhat torn between the two. I'm not sure I would like to be the strong mother person who gives, uh, who cares about the young and the helpless. So but I'm feeling young and helpless <laughs> and fragile. Could you turn that concept of mothered? Could you could you like um, uh, be more specific about that? Find a word that articulates the es essence of that word mother for you. What would it be? N nurturing. Nurturing. Okay, so that's the word you want to repeat. I am strong and nurtured and nurturing or whatever, you know, so that you're, um, partly so that your deeper self knows you're listening, <laughs> you know. What, what awakened mind meditation and silent meditation, awakened mind meditation is active meditation. Silent meditation is just meditation without beta, as we're going to see in a minute. What all meditation is about is that 
going deep down inside yourself to know yourself better. And then being able to get the information that will help you act on the information. That's what awakens us, you see. That's what makes us more than we were before. But it requires a commitment on our part. I mean, you know, we can't just wander off into the blue yonder and say, hmm, I'll do that someday and expect to see a change because it doesn't happen. I think that I way. was the deer in the headlights. Yeah. You know, it was time to. Yeah. To make, repeat a, make it. something positive out of that. There you go, to repeat it. The other thing uh, that's important to say here is that this is real information. Um, what you get down in your subconscious, especially uh, if it spontaneously arises and, um, and you go, oh, I didn't expect to be a bear or a panther or a raccoon? Who made up a raccoon? Well, you know that's your deeper self. Um, because you felt that your conscious mind didn't do it, it just popped up on its own. And you, you want to honor this information because that's how the conscious mind starts to notice that it has a subconscious and quits trying to do everything on its own. The poor ego thinks it's all alone in the world and it has to figure out everything. It has to be in the driver's seat. I have to take care of this body. I have to take care of all these people. I have to take care of this work. So it goes around in high beta. But the first time it encounters a valuable piece of information, it starts to say, who was, who was that? What? Where did that come from? And then it looks again, and then the deeper self gives it more, and then the conscious mind says, oh, could I sit in the passenger seat and somebody else drive this car for a change? Somebody give me a break. And so that's where you get the unification of consciousness, not just bilaterally symmetrical, but integrated when the conscious and the subconscious. So if you actually will use this information, you'll get more more and more and more solutions, answers to every question. And wouldn't that be nice to know that you are the repository of all your questions and answers and that you can trust them and be guided by them? I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, one time uh, I had a small group of people at my house and um, we, we did this meditation and there were all women, four women and one guy. And so after the meditation, he says, well, I wanted to be a panther. I wanted to be a big cat and I was a squirrel. <laughs> and he just didn't like this at all. He, you know, he had a great, clear, vivid experience uh, of, of being a squirrel, but it just didn't sit right with him. He felt like his, if that really came from his deeper mind, that it was somehow a, in conflict with or betraying his intention. So we went upstairs to lunch and everybody's laughing and having a good time and I'm watching this guy and he's sitting over there and he's just got a bone that he is gnawing on and he is just really, and so I go and say, so what's going on there? He says, I didn't want to be a squirrel. I wanted to be a big cat. And he said, and I just don't understand why <laughs> this happened. And I just looked at him and my delta intuition came on. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a high altitude iron worker. And I said, well, I think you ought to be as bright, alert, and quick as your deeper mind said you are as a squirrel. <laughs> You're on 14 stories high. I don't think a panther is going to do as well as a squirrel in that kind of job. And it turned out that this guy had just got this job and he was worried. He was scared he was going to fall. So his deeper mind in the meditation was saying, you're not going to fall because this is your true nature and you believe in it and you will be it. See? Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. So what you did then when you got that information, the moment I said, what makes you happy? What makes you sad? What gives you courage, strong and powerful? And your qualities and characteristics. You had to get that out of theta. And if you got what you feel like was real information, then you were in a combination of alpha and theta, which is the definition of meditation.
So if you can remember what that felt like, even though you had an active mind and you had impressions streaming in and you were interacting, that was an alpha-theta meditation state. Now we said that uh, you might have had a past life bear there uh, because your delta flashed on ahead of time. So delta uh, is the personal unconscious mind that's in direct connection with the collective unconscious, with this quantum field of energy and information. This is our instinctual radar, and it's so quiet. These frequencies are so low and slow, and they are on all the time. We've had these frequencies, this radar, since we were cave people. This is what kept us from getting eaten by dinosaurs, right? We just know the hackles on the back of the neck rise up and we say, whoops, here comes the dinosaur, or a person with ill intent or somebody we just feel might be harmful to us. So that radar goes on towards someone else in empathy or sympathy or love. And the moment that radar goes on, depending on how far it goes out, how strong it is, then here come intuitive impulses back on the same ray. Some of us are more intuitive than others. Sometimes that's the result of hypervigilance. You know, I never cease to be amazed and touched by the beautiful system that has been set up for us, this consciousness. You can get to God from any direction. You can go through beta and intellectual realizations that there's got to be something more than is visible in this manifest world. You can go through alpha and you connect con through nature or through healing. You can go through theta, through personal work or direct connection with your soul. Maybe you're going to do inspired writing. Maybe it's coming through dreams. Or you can go through Delta and take a class in Reiki. And suddenly, kaboom, uh, you reach out. And uh, as in a Reiki study that I did where several people were hooked up, they just shared information. I tell these stories in my Psychic Soul book. Um, they moved into the same, as you did with the raccoons here, they moved into the same resonant pattern. And then they started to share information. And so this is what Cade was talking about. Um, healers have a lot of delta, a very high amplitude delta, maybe goes out to, this is about three to five microvolts in amplitude. Healers can have delta out to here because they're sending uh, through their intention uh, an urge, a thought, a desire to heal themselves or someone else. And this is why Casey said at the end of meditation, send out healing energy and you're going to get it back and it will rejuvenate, revitalize and recalibrate you. So this is the realm of psychic awareness, uh, also dreamless sleep. Uh, if you do any soul travel, you're down in delta only, so the mind is completely free. There's no beta to say, hey, 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 why are we lifting up? You just lift up and you just travel. All psi events happen down here in delta. So this is an orchestration. Uh, an integration of some of those categories, that all those categories that we saw, except that in meditation, the beta is quiet. And you can, with the color of, that I used for the background here, feel that meditation pattern, can't you? It's vast, it's spacious, it's warm and cool at the same time. It's aware only of itself, and meditation, uh, in an optimal meditation state, everyone experiences it differently. But, but you can say, in general, that a meditation pattern um, is an awake and aware and lucid state of consciousness in which you are aware of your pure mind or your pure spirit. And it's because you're down here with your awareness focused in alpha, theta, and your delta moving out to that field and able to um, receive and perceive information that's more than it knows and understands.
And ultimately, all of this work and all of our meditations are about becoming conscious of what was not known or understood before. So we go down into our delta to become conscious, our theta as well. So our next pattern, I call it a symphony of light. Um, this is the pattern of the awakened mind that we saw uh, with the moving brain waves to start with. It says, spiritual masters, long-time meditators, and people with a high-performance mind emit light, and the frequencies composing this brainwave biofeedback pattern, which is characterized by an open flow of clarity, creativity, insight, spiritual connection, and psychic awareness. Now, it is. Now, the reason that you have access is because the clarity comes from a very quiet beta. It's curved in up here, meaning there's really not much activity at all in the higher frequencies. So if you're in an awakened mind pattern, you can trust what you get from your subconscious theta, the information, the insights that you get from there, because there's nobody up here making it up. This is almost flat as in meditation. There's so little activity in it. This is a cooperative beta, a beta that, uh, that is letting its own deeper mind do the driving in that car, and it's sitting there and saying, yeah, yeah, I know this territory. This is great, and I'm taking a nap. Um, but it is registering. It is registering information, and it can cooperate and participate in the information. Uh, gathering and usage. Uh, awakened mind meditation uh, is about uh, going into a meditation with a question, an issue, or a challenge, and then finding the answer down in your theta, bringing the answer back up to your beta, and then the beta says, I can use this. So it's the same thing if you use your insights from the animal beingness meditation, then that's an awakened mind. That's an exercise in the awakened mind. Because part of you is saying, no, I got this from my deeper mind. I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to feel unprotected or weak or things are out of control. I'm going to say this mantra. And then you're back to this beautiful awakened mind pattern, which can expand into so much more. And we're going to look at that more. Uh, because the big meditation we're going to do is going to be beyond the awakened mind meditation out into the field. A symphony of light because essentially all thought impulses, all experience is composed of photons of light. Um, it used to be in the era of Max Cade and his successor, my teacher, Anna Wise, that people would uh, produce this evolved mind pattern. Every now and then, you'd come across somebody who produced an evolved mind pattern, a pattern of enlightenment, where the mind is, res the consciousness is resonating in harmony with universal mind. Uh, not anymore. There's been a sea change on this planet uh, and I see the evolved mind pattern a whole lot. It's a beautiful pattern because what the person is experiencing is unity and oneness. All the fences are down. The fences that are the alpha uh, are the beta separated from the alpha, the alpha separated from the theta, the theta from the delta. Those fences are down. There's no more conscious, subconscious, unconscious mind. There's only the oneness. The person is fully integrated by now. And what technically happens is that that delta that has been reaching out into the field is now pulling information and energy from the field so it turns up and sends that information all the way to the conscious mind. And this resonance says, oh, it's just one. There aren't any other people. It's just one field of beautiful, loving energy, you see. And when you get there in meditation, and it does happen in silent meditation just by an act of grace, when you get there, there's just bliss and tears. Oh, here it is, illumination, joy. 
And Max Cade found, said this in his book, and I have found it over and over to be true, that when people go to a higher state of consciousness, it stabilizes the lower state. So you go into an awakened mind pattern, it stabilizes your ability to meditate. You trip into uh, the realm of the evolved mind pattern, it stabilizes your awakened mind so that you can sustain it. So there's a stability and a continuity of consciousness. And how do you get this pattern? It's so easy. You just open up and receive what's there and waiting for you all the time. You just say, I am one, and I receive, and boom, you feel it, because it's always there. It's just an invisible fence. There's nothing there. And when you do that, something even more extraordinary happens. It can come from the awakened mind and flip to this pattern, or it can come from the evolved mind and flip to this pattern. Um, there's a lot of study about this now. I've been following gamma brain waves, which are faster than beta, uh, but instead of stress, anxiety, and panic like high beta is, when you move into 30 to 100 hertz gamma, there's peace and transcendence and mystical union. Uh, a sense of the divine, and some amazing things happen. This gamma shows up uh, right here, and it may well be a harmonic. This may be the bottom of an evolved mind circle here. Uh, but you can't see any higher because then you run into electrical interference and muscle tension interference and so much artifact. You can't look any higher than we're looking with the new mind mirror at 64 hertz. Um, but this could be an evolved mind pattern that is manifesting this awakened mind pattern underneath it. I have seen this pattern in John Van Alken when he was doing his passages uh, in consciousness meditation. He was hooked up. I've seen it in very powerful psychics. I've seen it in Malcolm Smith, the, uh, the healer, um, who comes from England uh, and travels the ARE circuit. Uh, it's pretty rare. But boy, do we want to develop it. And how do we develop it? Well, gamma comes out of the intentional awareness that you automatically develop with meditation. It comes out of the compassion that you automatically develop when you um, open up and receive and tear down the fences. Um, no matter what someone's doing to you, you're extending that compassion. Uh, it comes out of... Um, well, just pure meditation, that's the main thing. A sense of peace, a sense of transcendence. It shows up when people are having out-of-body experiences. Sending energy can trigger gamma waves. And when gamma comes into play, uh, then what's happening is that um, the gamma is forming new brain cells in the frontal cortex, which is, as we age, we want all the new brain cells we can get. <laughs> so it slows down aging. Uh, and it forms, it helps rewire new neural circuitry. So if you're making a change, if you're saying you're, I am, I am strong and invincible, uh, and, and you're in the middle of a meditation and you suddenly feel all these energies moving through you, your ga gamma's making you strong and invincible because it's rewiring your brain, so that becomes your belief. Interestingly, you know, there are no accidents in consciousness uh, in this holographic universe. So we see here the pattern of a human being. Well, Cade didn't calibrate that machine to give us a recognizable pattern. It just, that's the way it looks. He just put electrodes where they would pick up the signals the best, and the human being is the pattern. He didn't calibrate a circle for the evolved mind pattern of oneness. That's what oneness is. It's a big O. Right? And this pattern here is exactly uh, what you would think it is. It's divine energies coming out of these super fast gamma frequencies into an awakened mind pattern that you can then, by virtue of your being connected to your source, manifest in your everyday life. So this is a super conscious person who's connected to the super conscious. And then there's one more pattern I've found in the past two years, that one and then this one. 
Uh, we have a new mind mirror uh, that I've been working with an English manufacturer to develop over the past three years. And we have gamma frequencies, so all this stuff I've been positing is turning out to be real and sh actually showing up that theory is now true. Um, this other pattern I've seen is uh, an evolved mind with gamma frequencies on top of it. You don't see this except in meditation and very, very deep and profound meditation. I've only seen this in one woman uh, and she, well, I've seen it in a couple other people briefly, but I've seen one person sustain the pattern while she was in an uh, inner temple, uh, one of my meditations on the CD set. And uh, I took her into this inner temple, but then there, when she was there, she met up these angels and they were putting these light swords on her shoulders and telling her all this amazing information. And she came out of the meditation and she, she was literally out of body. And I said, so where were you? She said, just a minute, let me get back into my body. And uh, after a minute, I said, well, what was happening? She told me about this these angels, this angelic experience, I said, I theorized that pattern and there it is. And uh, she says, but I still don't know why I'm here, why I came here for the session. She was a member of my meditation group, but she'd never been for a brainwave session before. And I said, well, why don't you go ask the angels? And so she goes back into meditation and slammed right back into the superconscious pattern with gamma and then this to the pattern. And she came out with a whole lot of answers. Now that was a landmark <laughs> to develop the highest known brainwave pattern and state of consciousness. And I, I can't tell you here, but in the book I tell her story. And it was only then that I learned her story uh, about how incredibly psychic she has been all her life since near-death experience. So attention and awareness, inner transformation, compassion, that's what generates these uh, incredible brainwave patterns. Um, so I, I had this a crazy weekend of synchronicities where I went to do this brainwave pattern <clears throat> on John Van Auken on a Friday night, Malcolm Smith on a Sunday morning, and uh, uh, met up with a medium in a class at the ARE Center of New York on Saturday. So all this boom, 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 boom. And then Rosalia, this woman who went to the Temple of Angels on a Monday. So it was just four days of my going, oh my God, I'm, this stuff is, it's all, I'm seeing it, it's manifesting, it's real here. And so John um, says, I said, I'm writing this book for ARE Press, Your Psychic Soul. And he says, well, you should probably know about patterns of consciousness. So he sends me this, um, this little unpublished document he's gonna talk about to you here this weekend. And essentially, uh, in this graphic, it shows you that a truly superconscious person, and here's that superconscious brainwave pattern again, living in the earth plane, is able by virtue of the gamma waves to be in touch with the superconscious level of, con of uh, awareness, that dimension, in which resides a community of saints consisting of angels, teachers, and guides. And on the other side, your own angelic nature, your godlike higher self. Do you believe that you have a godlike higher self? but not everyone's nodding, and a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. It's so easy to be hung up down here, isn't it? And say, aw, oh, not me. If we're genetically inher inherited of God, so how can we not have? Exactly, your own intuition tells you that, but your logic can say, God. <laughs> Who's God? Um, I think we need a microphone over here. We have a question in the back. Yeah, I mean, you have this naysayer, this built-in naysayer who wants to keep you grounded. So getting in touch with and living through that God-like nature, your own higher self, um, is something that, it's like a tuning a radio. Oh, I'm tuned in. Ah, oh, the ego said, nothing but static, right? So it's, it's a progression, it's a journey, you know, to be able to, and how do you make that journey? You gotta meditate. 
because that's what keeps you in constant contact with your own alpha theta soul, your own delta awareness of your higher self and with the field itself. Keeps your system so coherent, see, so calm, so uh, so set up that your inner locus of control is inside yourself rather than reacting emotionally to everything else. The only path to the superconscious and ultimately to uh, oneness with universal consciousness is going to be meditation. And then you have a question back there? Actually, you just answered it. <laughs> Delta did it. <laughs> We ought to tell Delta Airlines about this. <laughs> the Spirit Airlines. <laughs> okay, question over here. What is the field? What is the field? Yes. Ooh, that's a great question. Do we have an answer here? Oh, by George, we do. <laughs> Before we read this crazy quote, just let me say that... Um, my meditative writings told me this uh, in the very earliest days, and they started talking about photons of light. And I went, ah, oh, that's my ego trying to make me feel important, photons of light. I didn't even look it up. Of course, we didn't have much of an internet back in 1987. But then all kinds of synchronistic experiences came along that showed me that everything is about photos, photons of light. All consciousness is light. Everything is light. The smallest packet of energy, the smallest bundle of energy, the subatomic down on the levels of quarks is the photon and it's made of light. And Casey knew that and he said, what is light? That from which all things come. Life and its manifestations is vibration and the vibratory force determines as to what its nature is. Not only what its nature is, what is your vibrational force, but that you give it out by the cell itself from which it produces as is seen in all matter. If we're coherent, we're producing coherence. If we're chaotic, we're producing chaos. You don't have the reading number there. Oh, tut, tut, tut. <laughs> Well, I tell you, I know I'm in the group that can come up with that very easily, and we'll have it for you by tomorrow. So um, we're going to do a meditation in a moment, um, but just to close this out, I want to let you know that um, everything we're talking about tonight is on this website of this organization that I founded, Institute for the Awakened Mind. Um, this is a consortium of awakened mind trainers working literally all over the world with the mind mirror to help people um, make sure they're in a meditation state, help them uh, produce and sustain an awakened mind state. And um, so there's lots of information on the site. In fact, here's a picture I'll point it out of my teacher, Anna Wise. She, uh, as a successor of Max Kaig, came to America with a mind mirror in 1981 and spent the next 30 years uh, writing books and creating recordings and teaching at Esalen Institute. And she taught um, 31 of us practicing practitioners today. Um, so on this website, you'll find all kinds of information under the Awakened Mind tab, how to meditate, awakening your mind, patterns of consciousness, the qualities of mastery. Um, we talked a little bit about that excited, enthusiastic, but there's a lot more in the very specific things that, you know, you can read and say, is that me or do I have a bit farther to go yet? Um, books, CDs, and videos. Uh, even training, you can get a private session with a practitioner or you can uh, join a group brainwave training or you yourself can learn, if you're looking for a new career, how to become uh, an awakened mind trainer. Buy a mind mirror, do some self-training or help train other people. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And what better time to do it than right now? Because here we are on Spaceship Earth, about to take a ride on Constellation Aquarius.
aren't we? Things are changing on this planet, and, and you see it because it's getting nuttier and nuttier on one level, <laughs> but on another level, and I tell you, I'm working with the most amazing people all over the world that are doing this uh, illuminative work coming out of all kinds of fields, using this mind mirror to awaken others and uh, themselves so awake from having done the work of inner transformation. All meditators dedicated meditators working uh, for personal and planetary transformation. And um, because of these Aquarian energies, just as this evolved mind pattern is showing up more now than ever before, now we have this opportunity. We got some help. You know, we're not alone down here on this quirky little planet. Uh, we've got some help and some helpers. So, hey, you want to take a trip to another dimension? All right, let's see how high we can go. So I'll play this little uh, lap harp for you. And if you find your beta talking to you, just relax the back of your tongue, slow your breathing, and uh, let's take a ride. Get comfortable in your chair. And if you like, then you can follow my voice into quiet. As you would follow your own breath. Down into a low and slow, quiet place that you found with your animal. Remember what it felt like to be in touch with your own deeper self. Breathe easily and deeply. easily and deeply. And listen to the music of your soul. The air that rides on the breath and with every deep inhalation and exhalation relaxes your body. quiets your mind. The light in the breath. Bringing it to any areas of tension to create relaxation. muscles of your forehead to relax and let that relaxation travel down into the corners of your eyes to relax the tiny muscles in your eyes and behind your eyes. Feel your eyes soften. So still and relaxed. And let the relaxation travel down to relax your chin and mouth. 
and the back of your tongue. And then just let that relaxation travel like a wave all the way down to the tips of your toes. Just wash all the way down. Relaxing your torso, your hips and pelvis, your arms and legs. And in this quiet and relaxation, you can begin to imagine yourself standing on a bridge above a beautiful, beautiful landscape. Notice what there is to see below you. Notice the sky and the horizon. What colors do you see? What textures? Are there any sounds? Notice how the longer and the more carefully you look, the more sensitive you feel. It's almost as if some higher energies are traveling into your body, into your mind, into your spirit. And in the stillness, you can see what you couldn't see before. And looking all around, you notice that on the bridge with you are hundreds of thousands of angels, radiant, loving, all connected with you in some way that you can't yet perceive, but you feel their energies. And in the depths of your consciousness, suddenly you realize that they are rising into the air. And you are rising with them. Below you, the world recedes. as you fly higher and higher. And your heart leaps with joy here in the company of angels. Higher and higher you go. into a realm of pure white light. A 
stand before you, you see some kind of edifice. And you know that the angels are ushering you to this place. And you slow down. It seems to be some kind of temple, some holy or sacred place. And you go inside. And there is a brilliant, brilliant white light over in one corner of this place. And you know with complete certainty that this is your own higher self. And you've come to learn more about your own true nature. It is familiar from dreams, from meditation. But now you can commune with it. And you do. Just listen and receive. see the truth of yourself. And you feel the love. To infinite love and acceptance. And you see the pathway to your higher self. You 
understand what needs to happen. Notice how it feels in your body to be in communion with your own higher self. Find words or images send them to your conscious mind. Ask a question. What does your conscious mind want to know? When the answer comes, can you feel the truth of it? If not, ask again. It's almost time to leave this place, but you can come back here at any time at all. So notice now the return of all the angels to take you back to the bridge. You say your goodbyes. And you depart, this time, stronger in your flight. More directed in your course. With merely a thought, you're back at the bridge. <clears throat> and
and you feel more luminous, different from before. Are there any other differences? If so, what are they? Slowly, you settle back down into your conscious awareness, retaining the memory of your true self so you can stay connected with it. And as you make that connection, the angels disappear and become the unseen forces. But you know they're there, and you know who you are from direct experience. and can go back at any time. So begin now to find a closure for your meditation. In your own time, very gently, returning back to this outside space, feeling alert, refreshed, and enlightened. Mm -hmm.